Now, from what we said last time, you might be wondering, and rightly so, how can Jesus be at the same time true man and true God? Well, to answer this question, I must first risk explaining something even more confounding to our human minds. The fact that God has revealed himself to us in the Bible as one eternal being, while at the same time three distinct persons. What makes this so difficult is that in our human experience, we are limited to thinking that one human being equals one person. However, with God, that is not so. In theological lingo, it's called the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, this is important because it will give us assistance in understanding how it is that Jesus Christ can be God and man at the same time. First, what is the difference between being and person? Well, a being is the very core or essence of a person. A person is a distinct individual possessing a mind, will, and emotions. You know, in the Old Testament, uh, the cry of the prophets was, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Deuteronomy 6. The God of Abraham is one Lord in distinction uh, to the plethora of other gods worshipped in the polytheistic nations. The Jewish religion was monotheistic, meaning one God, in its understanding of God. Yet, throughout the Old Testament, we find God described as more than one person. This teaching of the triune God uh, begins with the creation account in Genesis. We read in Genesis 1, In the beginning, God, which is normally understood as God the Father, created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Now, from the very beginning of Genesis, we have a distinction between the Spirit of God, who was hovering over the waters, and God, who said, Let there be light. We also have an indication of the tri-personality of God when we read in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Now, this image and likeness does not have to do with physical appearance, since we're told in the Bible that God is spirit without a body. Our being made in God's image has to do with having some of the same personal attributes as God himself has. The primary things that separate human creatures from all other things that God made are a mind that can reason, a will that can act, and emotions that can be felt and expressed. The upshot here is that the God of the Bible is one God, one eternal being, and at the same time, three distinct yet equal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, if this, the if this seems hard to grasp, welcome to the club, but it is what we are compelled to believe from the weight of biblical teaching. Here are just a few examples. In Matthew 28, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name, that's singular, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians 13, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And in John 15, but when the Holy Spirit comes, whom I, Jesus, will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Now, there are two other points I want to leave you with on this subject. One, the Bible seems to be saying that the self-existent, eternal being of God, by virtue of his greatness and glory, is much too big to be contained in one person. And the other thing is that God, being three distinct persons in one divine being, having always existed before anything else, means that God was always able to enjoy the intimate and loving relationship within his own being. This also means that God chose to extend that love to his human creatures, who were not made because God was lonely, but because it pleased the triune God to make them and love them. So we have a God who is three distinct persons while at the same time having one essence or being. Now let's look at one of the persons declared by the Bible to be God. If the Father is seen as the first person within the Trinity and the second person is the Son, another name for this second person is the Word or Logos in the Greek. The Logos in this sense means the expressive thought or reason of God. Also, the creativity and the wisdom of God. 
The Apostle John begins his gospel writing about this word. He writes in John 1, In the beginning, we should remember that goes right back to Genesis 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. From this passage, then, we know that whoever this word is, he was with God and was himself God, that through him everything was made that came into existence. John then tells us that this word took on human flesh. In John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And just a few verses later, John gives us the identity of this word. In John 1, 29, the next day John, that's the, but John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The essential thing that makes Jesus Christ our ultimate go-between before a holy God is that unlike any other human being, he has two natures, one divine and one human. Just like the idea of the Trinity, this is a hard one for us, for we think in terms of one person possessing one nature. In the case of Christ, however, it is different. The second person of the Trinity, who is God the Son, has always existed within the one being of God. The eternal Son of God is one divine person with one divine nature. But then comes what is called the fullness of time. At this particular moment in human history, the eternal Son literally invades human existence by being born as a human through a very normal birth process. It is here that the eternal Son takes on an additional nature, which is human. In Galatians 4.4, 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, although the birth process was normal, the conception was anything but normal. You see, there was no male sperm present in this conception. Mary contributed her very substance to Christ's humanity, but it was the miraculous and mysterious overshadowing of the Holy Spirit that supernaturally fertilized her egg. In Luke 1, 35, And the angel said to her, saying, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that the Holy One is to be born will be called the Son of God. This is how Jesus can have two distinct yet united natures, one divine and one human. Being both God and man enables Jesus to perform exactly what we need in a mediator, one who will be our substitute and actually save us from our sins. Being fully human allows Jesus to identify fully with you and me, knowing what it means to be tempted and to suffer and to die. Being fully God allows Jesus to always do his Father's will in all things and to be the true righteous man necessary to stand in our place of judgment. There are two specific acts that Jesus performs for his people in order to save them. The first act is complete obedience to God's law. This is called Christ's active obedience to the law of God. Jesus Christ obeyed and, and fulfilled the moral law, the Ten Commandments, without fail and without break. Hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus, the psalmist wrote of how he would keep the law of his Father gladly. In Psalm 40, we read, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Even at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, we see this active doing of all things righteous. Jesus had no need to be baptized by his cousin John as a sign of repentance, being himself pure and sinless, but Jesus asked to be baptized anyways. In Matthew 3, then Jesus came to Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so for now, for it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then John allowed him. 